All right, so I've had a few of, actually, I've had uh, over a dozen of you that have emailed me over the past few months asking when I was going to bring Pedge Tattoos back on the show. He's been on a couple times. He's a good friend of mine. And um, one guy I've been wanting to do a show on that's kind of flown under the radar, it's never talked about, is uh, the late Gambino captain, Bobby Glasses Vernassi. He was a Queens base captain. He had a long and conspicuous career in organized crime that began back in the early 70s, I believe, and ran until he went away on federal charges in 2014. He was ultimately convicted in 2013 for racketeering as well as on the 1981 double homicide of John Diagnese and Richard Godkin, which was caused from a drink being spilled on a date of one of Bobby's Gambino mob associates. At the time of his conviction, Bobby Glasses was an actual sitting member of the ruling panel of the Gambino crime family. So he was definitely uh, a big wig in the Gambino family in his latter years of operating, no doubt. So Pedge actually has a lot of personal insight on Bobby Glasses. And I know several of y'all have been wanting me to bring him back on. So I thought this would be the perfect opportunity so I have Pedge with me right now. How's it going, buddy? How you doing, Mike? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, first, let me just say uh, I'm kind of surprised that a lot of guys were emailing you, and I'm kind of like very flattered uh, that they found my interviews, you know, intriguing enough. So I'd like to thank those those people that you know requested, and I'd like to thank you for requesting, you know, me to do another interview. Uh, I know we've been talking about doing a doing a couple of uh, interviews on. Uh, yaks and uh, you know and bobby bobby glasses and stuff like that and i hope this uh story you know kind of grabs people's interest and you know gets to see a side of bobby well absolutely and then that's the thing it's like i like to kind of try to find things within the subject that are you know kind of new and and like i said right. bobby was obviously a captain in the gambino family somebody who um, was part of history but doesn't get discussed with history. And um, and I know, you know, you've shared a lot of stories uh, with me about yeah, him, yeah. even a little bit in, right. in, our, uh, right. in our last interview. So I thought it would be really cool for everybody to be able to, you know, sure. give you to share some of the, that insight. To, to start, I, uh, I met Bobby just by hanging out in the cafes, you know, um, as as every you know up and up and coming associate or whatever whatever the case may be, um, you know I hung out at every cafe possible. You know I, I drank twenty espressos just to to be at the right time at the right place to see the guy who walked by and just say how you doing. You know what I'm saying? Right. Just, well, and just and, and, let, and let me stop you for a second. For those of you who sure. have not heard my prior interviews with Pedge, obviously you should definitely go back and check those out. And, you know, uh, Pedge was associated with entities within the Gambino family, but he was also associated with uh, individuals within the Bonanno crime family, too. Yeah. So I just wanted yeah. to say that. So go ahead. I'm sorry, buddy. Yeah, no, no, no worries. I'm going to I'm going to say I'm not really good. You know, I'm getting up there in age, too. I can't <laughs> give, give you actual dates, but um, right. it was around the time when um, he got arrested for that, that, that double murder, you know. Right. Um, I, I, I met him, uh, in passing or, uh, you could say like, I wasn't formally introduced to him. He knew of me, you know, like, uh, you know, Hey kid, I need a favor. Go do this, you know, or, Hey, you're connected with the, uh, Yugoslavian people to remain. You speak both languages. I'm like, yeah, I speak Serbian and Romanian. Yeah. I got a little problem with this one guy. Can you do me a favor and go with this guy and talk to him, you know, get this shit straightened out. And, you know, so that's, that's how I originally met Bobby, you know, right. um, his cafe, um, at the time I was living maybe, I don't know, eight, nine blocks away uh, from the cafe. But I would frequent the cafe because they'd be an Italian bakery on the corner. I'd go get a loaf of bread. You know, I, like I said, I grew up more Italian than I did Serbian. So, And by my accent, I sound more Italian than I do Serbian, you know. 
But uh, I'd get my loaf of bread, go over there by the coffee place. Uh, the girl behind the bar, she was Romanian. And um, so I'd speak to her and I'd get a cup of coffee. A few of the guys in the front I'd know. And as time would go on, more guys would come in that I, I grew up with or I knew from the neighborhood. And they, they, they ended up, you know... Uh, going further in the career with the with the mob, either uh, you know getting their buttons or whatever. Right. I, I really don't know, you know, but I know a lot of guys came and went through that place. Um, I officially got introduced. Uh, well, I, I got vouched for, you could say. Um, I don't want to be any disrespectful, you know. I know uh, the person Vito that introduced me, uh, Vito Cortesano. He doesn't like to go by the name Vito Love anymore, so out of respect. And out of, you know, uh, true love and respect for, for Vito, you know, never did me wrong. He actually introduced me in the back room to, to Bobby, like, and vouched for me and said, this is the kid I've been talking about. And that's when Bobby was like, you know, gave me a kiss on the cheek and was like, I know you, you run around, you do this, you do that, you, you're the go-to guy or whatever, you know. So, you know, uh, you know, that's how I basically was vouched for and introduced. And after that, that's when... You kind of become an associate after that. It's like you know, you're the you're the the golfer, the go-to guy, whatever whatever the story may be. And that's when uh, I found out that he was very low key. You know, uh, I knew about the murder. I never fucking talked about it. I never said shit. You know, but of course, you know, if right. you know he's got them, if you know he's got them kind of bones, you know, you know the deal. You know, most of the guys do. Uh, but uh, he was, from what I knew in the neighborhood, he was a, a loan shark. He loaned everybody money. Uh, he did, uh, you know, those those nights where you gamble, you do whatever. He had machines, and right. you know, any any gambling operation that was that was him. Uh, he was very low key over the years. Like 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 most mobsters would get pinched for this, would get you know for that, whatever the story may be. You know, he not him. He was. Yeah, you he know, actually he had, he had a really long run from the time that he, he was an associate really, to later. You know? He really did, and you know, like you know, I told you my, my stints. I'd go back and forth to you know to Bosnia, and I was here, I was there. I'd hang out in the Bronx, then I moved to Brooklyn for a bit. That didn't quite work out too much, you know. I, I was with Bosco for a bit. I was all over the place, you know. So it wasn't like I wasn't stuck in one thing. I was. I was kind of like one of those guys that just got a, got a little nervous being doing the, the same thing a little too long. So I would just get up and do my own thing. You know, one minute I'd be here, one minute I'd be there. So I got to meet a lot of people over the years. But with Bobby was always, when I came back and I bought my house on 73rd of Myrtle, which was a few blocks from the cafe, I was there all the time. So from when the cafe opened, I was there. And at that time is when a lot of Romanians immigrated right. to... Uh, to, uh, to Ridgewood and to Glendale. And uh, Vito was, um, you know, not to be disrespectful and to say, you know, anything bad or I don't want Vito getting mad or anything like that, but I'm trying to be as respectful as possible. You know, uh, Bobby was his godfather and um, Vito was was up and coming. Vito went down with him when he got, when he got locked up, you know. Right. But the whole crew got locked up, all the guys, you know. Right, yeah, so, that what they called uh, that the mob takedown day. That's when Bobby yeah, went down, exactly. right? Yeah, and as as in my prior uh, interview, Bobby knew, like you know, what I was doing and whatever. And Bobby saw saw something, I guess, in me, you know, and kind of gave me that heads up about, like, you know, you, like you got a kid now, you should get the hell out of here, you know. Right, and that made me like move to Jersey. You know, I moved to the sticks. You know, and I raised my son in that country atmosphere. My son, you know, he didn't, you know, he didn't know jack shit. He thought I was a, like a soccer dad with a thick accent. He didn't know nothing. You know, my neighbors knew I was wearing a tracksuit and a, you know, seven carat gold cross around my neck. You know, I didn't look too good in a small town. You know what I mean? But right, right. It is what it is. It kind of got me out of out of that atmosphere, and then I started to like the accent started to die down a little bit, and. My, my way of uh, dressing started to change. I, I didn't look like, you know, one of the Sopranos, you know what I mean? Right. But, but uh, I mean, um, from there, what really made me, like, open my eyes was, you know, Vito did time. Um, you know, Bobby was locked up. Uh, Vito did his time. And I just went through my cancer, went through my divorce. You know, I, I was, my head was just not where it was supposed to be. And uh, I came back to the neighborhood because I had a four family. Came back to the neighborhood, and um, 
I really wasn't looking to run into anybody. I wasn't going to cafes. I wasn't. I was trying to be low key, but trying to just you know make a little money, whatever I could do. And uh, Vito, Vito saw me, gave me a kiss on the cheek, and just basically told me he goes, you know, it, this is like uh, it's like a big pond with a lot of alligators, you know. And I'm just like looking at him, like I don't get what he's trying to say, and he's just like. Dude, everybody around you is a rat. He goes, people put me away. People put Bobby away. He goes, everybody's flipping on each other. He goes, you got a kid? Get the fuck out of here. You know? And I was like, well. And, and, and what fun. what what time period was this? What year was this? This was in 2015. Oh, okay. So this, so was, about, this, this was about a year, year and a half after Bobby got locked up? Yeah, Bobby got locked up. Vito did, I think Vito did 19 months. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Uh, I know he was away. He had an ankle monitor on. I know that. Uh, and he came to the gym, you know, and, you know, when he came to the gym, everybody knew who he was, you know, like everybody was like waving to him, but he specifically came to me and kissed me on the cheek. And that, that, that amongst associates is like, you know, you're in with everybody, you know, you, you know, you're an associate as well. And, um, you know, he gave me the kiss and pulled me to the side and was like, you know, what are you up to? And I'm like, nah, not really. This and that. He goes, listen, uh, I know you. I know you're trying to earn. You're trying to do something. He goes. You got a kid. He goes. I, I, I'm sorry for what happened to you. You had cancer. You're good now. I'm like, yeah. He goes. Get the fuck out of here. He goes. Everybody here is a bunch of rats. He goes. Everybody's fl- everybody's just looking to flip. He goes. Do you really want to see your kid through a plate glass window? You know. So he goes. You, he, he go. Bobby telling me right. Like before he got locked up. He told. He told me this. And then this guy go, goes in and then he tells me. You know. Vito tells me. And. I took that as, like, my, my get-out-of-jail-free card. Like, just get the fuck out of here. Like, leave, you know? And it, it, I'm not going to sit there and lie to you. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you've you done interviews with John Alita. You've done interviews with Frankie Tortolino, uh, right. many other guys. It's not a fucking life that's easily forgotten. It's not, an, it's not a life that, you know, me and you shoot the shit from time to time, and I tell you stories, and we could giggle. I talk to Frankie, and... Right. You know, we giggle about stories, but, uh, you know, in, in those times, that's that's all we knew, you know, that I'm, I'm sorry to say, but there's a there's a hidden history of, of uh, Glendale, Ridgewood and Bushwick that isn't told. Everybody just talks about Bath Avenue, Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, Bensonhurst, but there was a lot of fucking crazy shit going on, like. Glendale, Ridgewood, Bushwick, you know, from Carmine Galante, you know, Bobby Glasses, you know, all these guys. Right, and then know, and then uh, up into the latter times with the Giannini guys, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, with the Giannini guys, I'm going to be honest, they were just... Wild Yeah, kids. look, I don't want to talk shit, but, you know, out of fucking 11, 12 guys that that all did these crimes and all of this, all of the stuff that they did, the only guy is Paulie Ragusa that stood up, did his fucking time, and came out and got locked up again. Right. You know, everybody else flipped. Uh, to me, that's just going against the code. But then again, uh, what is the code? Like, you know, Frankie said it best to me. He goes, we all drank the Kool-Aid. You know, like we all believe that if we drank that Kool-Aid, we saw a different life. Uh, the Kool-Aid fucking wore off and it wasn't what it was. It was just. Right. Which, 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 which with those guys, it's kind of interesting because a lot of those guys are third, fourth generation you know, the, I mean, yeah. like like Frankie pointed yeah, out to me, a, you know, they, that all their dads and uncles and grandfathers are all mobbed up going back to mobbed, Sicily, all, right? At that, like I told you, at one time it was just it was Ridgewood was just like I couldn't go anywhere. Like if you know, if, if I went to a club in Long Island, if I went to a club in even in fucking Jersey, like I went somewhere and I showed them my ID, they were like, "Oh, one one three eight five, you can't come in here." They thought we were part of the Ridgewood group, you know, the right. Giannini's. And, I, and I, I, I'd have to sit there and say, I'm not part of them. No, 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 no. All you guys from Ridgewood are troublemakers. And I'm like, what the fuck? So it got <laughs> to the point where, you know, I, I even changed my license and I made it in Long Island at, the, at, at my cousin's house just so that, like, you know, hey, look, I live in Westbury. Just, you know, just so I can get into fucking places. Because it was like the minute you get to the door, you're waiting 45 minutes and they wouldn't let you in. Right, because you know? their reputation, but, um, right. Exactly. I mean, their reputation exceeded them. That's why I don't understand, like, at the end, all these deals and plea bargains. And, and, you know, I understand push comes to shove. Like, I got a kid. So I understand if you got a kid and you're already in age and, you know, time now is a whole it's a whole different fucking ball of wax. You know what I mean? Right. But, you know, at the end of the day, they were all young, up and coming. 
could have did you fucking five ten came out like like Paulie. Paulie did nineteen. He came out. You know, Ragusa. He's he's like one of the old time fucking yeah. typical of Cosa, Cosa Nostra guys. Like he just did well, out of yeah. Two. Look at his situation again. He got pinched and he's still doing his time. Well, he's not trying, right. Six months. I called the neighbor just to touch base with a, with a guy, and he tells he tells me he goes uh, he goes hey you know Paulie got out. I'm like oh good for him man you know and what's he doing? I don't know. He's doing this. He's trying to move this. He's this that that. Uh, but I like I said I give I give him respect. I mean you know he was a scrapper. And you know he, you know he did what he had to do. And dude, to do 19 years and come out and to try to get back in the game right away—that's the old school mentality. That's the way that you know the other guys were. Right. Uh, there ain't there ain't that that mentality no more. That that that's all long and gone. And I remember we had a conversation, and you said to me that, hey, you know, if I was to go back to the neighborhood, I would get a lot of respect from these young guys. I'm gonna be honest with you. When I came back in 2015, it, it was a whole. That's what I thought. Like, oh. My name gets mentioned, and oh, it's that guy. Remember that guy? He used to run shit. He used to do this. He used to do that. He ran with this guy. It wasn't like that. It was they wanted to test me to see if I still got the, you know, the moxie or whatever. Like, am I still gonna? I had to lay a few guys out. Like, just interesting. Yeah, you know, like one guy. You know, I'm not gonna sit there and and and, and lie or make it look bigger than it was. But I, I I used to call him little little Joey, you know. So I'm like, hey, little Joey, you don't, you don't fucking call me little Joey, you know what I mean? I'm 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 big Joe now, this and that. All right, you do a little juice, you think you're fucking big. Relax. When you were in diapers, I used to fucking put twenty bucks in your diapers. I'm like, you know, relax, you know. Oh, don't don't fucking talk to me like that. I'm like, yo, you better back the fuck up. I go, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask you again. I go, I I didn't come. You be to you be putting little again. Joey on his ass. <laughs> I did. I fucking I, I I laid him the fuck out, and you know. He was just like all discombobulated. I picked him the fuck up. I said, "Go to the cafe and go we'll talk to your uncle, whoever's in charge now, because I'm gone all these years. Bobby's locked the fuck up. I don't, I don't know who's who, you know." Right. And I, so I this, go this was down. this was before Bobby passed away in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. I found, and you know, it really sucks. I found out the hard way about that. Like, you know, somebody could have called me and said, "Hey, you know, this one passed away. You know, that one passed away." Right. I heard like nine months after he passed away that he passed away. I'm not in that circle anymore. So, right, right, right. you know, uh, because of your show, I got in the circle again with a lot of guys and, uh, you know, Frankie being one of them, you know, and like I said, I've never had no bad blood with Frankie. I never, I heard people were saying so much shit about Frankie, you know, uh, he's a fucking rat. He's a this, he's a that. Uh, look, it, when, at the end of the day, when you're in somebody else's fucking shoes, right. they're offering you a deal. And basically all you got to do is, Turn on the guy that's turning on you. Well, what the fuck are you gonna do? I'm sorry. I'm well, turn. well, and, and shit, too you know? at that point in time, I mean, if for crying out loud, the boss of the entire family was flipping. He gave up forty four fucking guys in one shot. Right. Like I mean, Joe Messina. You know, I yep. mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure. I, and then, I, and I then on top that. of that, you had captains flipping. You had the Cantarellas flipping. I mean, there were there was a lot Everybody of people. To me. You know. Everybody was flipping because they didn't want to do the time. They're all in their 40s and 50s. They don't want to go away for 20, 25 years, come out when it's seven. This is not right. like Sonny Francis where, you know, he comes out 101. You know what I mean? Like, that guy's fucking hardcore. He came out 101. The guy's still like, yeah, he's you know, legendary. Shit, you know, like getting back to, to Bobby, like the main topic of this, you know, after I was introduced to Bobby, um, basically at, at uh, what at what you know, what time period were you introduced to him what like what year was it uh, early 90s uh so what was he made yet when you met him yeah he was yeah he okay was, made. He was, was he more of like a racketeer type gangster like a money gangster <sighs> from i mean like from from my observations and from the word on the street he was he was just a money man you know right, he, was the, right. he was the he was the he was into rackets Mm -hmm. But it was like, you know, um, he had a little bit of everything. So, like, you know, he had guys that he knew that were doing cars. If you wanted to do cars, do cars. You pay him whatever the fuck you pay him. You know what I'm saying? He didn't tell you, like, oh, I want 50% of your business or whatever. You, you just, you paid your tax. You know, you, right. you know, if you had your own crew, you'd go see him. You know what I'm saying? It was like he was in charge of that area of Queens, the Gambinos in that area. Everybody came and paid their respects and paid their tax and whatever the fuck it was, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, from Romanians to Serbians to Albanians, whoever the fuck was who. There was no, I mean, even though, like, uh, I belonged to 
a group of guys that were doing cars and whatever the fuck they you know, everybody was doing a different fucking thing. One guy was, uh, whatever he was doing, robbing old ladies. I don't fucking know. Uh, <laughs> you know, somebody would come and pick that envelope up and go give it to fucking Bobby. You know, me, myself, after a while of seeing this, I put one and one together and said, you know, I'm not going to go to the cafe over here and, you know, hang out with these knuckleheads. I'm going to go straight to the fucking, to the horse's mouth. That's when I got vouched for, you know, because right. I, I wanted to, I wanted to expand. I wanted to do something. I wanted to open up a bar, you know, and I was looking around for a couple of years, you know, and um, in uh, late 96, um, I got to open up my bar. Uh, it was an established bar by an established family, which I shall not mention. But um, they owned the building. They owned the bar. The bar was uh, it, whatever the guy did out of that place. He wasn't making money. It was like he made it a cigar lounge. Didn't work. Uh, he made it a regular nightclub. Didn't fucking work. I, I had a vision. And I said, look, I, I could do this, this and that. I basically walked in with zero, like, you know, like zero, straight up zero. And it was like, how much are you going to put down? I'm like, zero. Uh, so who, who are you going to put the license under? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I didn't have any fucking clue about anything. And they basically just hugged me and kissed me and said, look, we know who you are. We know you can make this happen. This is going to be the juice. We're going to front you the money for the bar. This is going to be the lease. And that was it, you know. And from there, um, the machines and everything belonged to Phil Navarro. Mm -hmm. and everybody had a, you know, Bobby had his route, you know. You know, the Gambinos had their route, the Bananos had theirs. There's some area that maybe there was Columbo's, I'm not exactly too sure, but it was mostly Bananos and, and Gambinos. So I knew Phil Navarra way back. I didn't want to be disrespectful to Phil Navarra, but since I was opening a Serbian-only club, you know, and mm -hmm. most of the clubs that were social clubs that were, they were Yugoslavian. It was Serbian, Romanian, uh, Albanian, Montenegrin, Baz. It was a fucking mismatch. I didn't want that anymore, like... I wanted just a Serbian place where Serbian guys could hang out, feel free. Traditional. Yes, right. yes. So I opened up that bar. Uh, you know, I explained to the family, you know, I had to sit down. And I said, I'm going to do a Serbian-only bar. Albanians are going to get pissed because it's on Fresh Pond Road. And the only thing that was on Fresh Pond Road was the Giannini Cafe before they closed it down and the European Cafe, which was right across the street from me. And that was just basically... You know, uh, the, you know, Baldo that had the cafe across the street, Baldo just moved across the street and took mm -hmm. over that cafe. And it was, you know, pretty much Albanian thugs trying to make their way up in the ranks of the Gambinos and the Bananos. And mm -hmm. they would hang there and just do dirt for them, you know. And um, so it was going to be an issue. So I had to go to Bobby and get the okay on that. So, you know, I was already introduced through, through Vito. And I, and I just told Bobby, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. He goes, I got no issues. He goes, you do whatever you got to do. He goes, uh, you know, why is it that you want to fill out? And I said, because I know I'm going to kill the business with everybody else, meaning the jukeboxes and the pool tables and everything, because they're going to, you know, I'd rather have the Gambinos come in and keep the Gambinos happy than, you know, you know, like, I don't want people being sent to my place to destroy stuff. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. You know, you're taking away all my business. You got all my customers. Because I knew once I opened up a Serbian establishment, everybody's going to go nuts and want to come to my place only because they know it's going to be a safe haven for them. You know, don't get me wrong. I've had my instances where Albanians have snuck in, Muslims have snuck in, you know, because my bouncers don't know the difference between what a Muslim looks like and what a Serbian looks like and whatever. And there would be nights where I'd be, I'd let everybody in. The rest of the week, you know, you can come in. And I, I even told one guy, you can come in. I guarantee you can come in. I don't guarantee you're going to walk out alive. I go, <laughs> because these guys are going to cut you up. They're going to kill you. Right. So that one guy had a lot of respect for me. Went back to Astoria, told a lot of the Muslims that, hey, it's a cool guy. You can come here. You can hang out during the week. But, you know, when it's live music, he wants to do his thing. And I changed it. I did folk music one night. I did rock and roll you know, like for the for a different group. So I got like a I got a Manhattan group of Serbs that I never knew existed that used to come to my bar. You know, oh, and very cool. um, like it, it was it was a really it was really crazy. At, you know, I mean for for a bar in Ridgewood, you know, my maximum capacity was 175 people. I've had the fire department come a few times and like, oh, you, know, you got way too many people. Meanwhile, I had half the people out in the backyard in the basement hit. 
and they still came in and were like, we can't move through here. This is a fire hazard. You need to clear this place out. You know, I like 250. Like double shit. fire capacity. Just, dude, it was, it, it was, a, but I mean, I made money with, with the European crowd. Everybody's buying everybody drink. It's not like an American crowd where you put a 20 on the table and yeah, give me a tab. It's none of that shit. Oh, these guys are, these guys are blowing three, four, five hundred dollars in one night, you know? Mm-hmm. So I made my money, like I said, um, and you know, Bobby okayed everything, you know, he said, you know, as long as Phil doesn't get angry, you know, uh, Phil never asked for anything like as like in like a pay, like a payout, like to give me whatever for me to leave. He left, you know, willingly he says no problem because I understand you don't want to make a beef. You know, I, I really felt bad because I was kind of closer to Phil, you know what I'm saying? Like growing up, you know, and it just, it was just. I don't know, like, I felt like I was walking the fence with that. Like, you know, it was, um, you know, you you, you, you got to show loyalty to one side. You know what I'm saying? Like, like with the uh, Gene Eney crew, they were showing loyalty to whoever fucking wanted it. You know what I'm saying? Because they were just trying to make their bones. I wasn't trying to make my bones. I was just trying to, you know, make money. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was trying to just make money with this bar and, and do my idea and whatever. And that ended up biting me in the ass because my own fucking people ended up, you know, trying to set me up and. You know, I got right. raided a few times, and you know, which, it which is were, what it is. Yeah, you know, that's the irony. Those were the people that you had the club exclusively open to. You know, it's... and yeah, once I once I made it a rule because Serbian people when they drink, they like to break. Meaning, like they like to like they get happy, they get over enthusiastic. It's this European thing. Like Greeks break uh, plates, mm-hmm. Serbians break glasses. So you know, glasses are flying. People are getting hit with broken glass. You know, I understand. I did it growing up. I would fucking smash everything, you know. Uh, then there was an incident with a gun, you know, over arm wrestling. I was just like, this is bullshit. Like, I'm like, you know, it was great while I was growing up and doing this shit. But... So I had a, uh, just a couple more questions I wanted to go over sure. with you on on Bobby. Um, did you did you know or was it known around the neighborhood that he was on the Gambino ruling panel near the end? Did you, um, did you hear yeah, anything with, about that? With certain, with certain people. Yeah. It was like, you really didn't talk about that, but like, right. You know, me being inside, you know, I kind of were like, I kind of saw that, you know, he was, he was gone a lot. Like he would go and he had to go to a meeting, you know, where people would come to go talk to him in the back. And it was just like big people would come, you know, God, these guys would come, this one would come, you know, that was rare because it would, you know, it would just be more like the other way around. Bobby would have to go, you know. Right. But uh, it was known that he was on. He he was a he was a shot caller. You know, he was a shot caller. So I so, mean, around that period, you knew that he was probably higher than I knew just it. The captain. I, listen to me. I, I I knew it, and like like I said once before, when there was this big issue uh, where uh, I was in a bar, wrong place, wrong time. Uh, Romanian guy, uh, Muslim Albanian guy was getting drunk. Uh, it was his Gumar's sister's place. So that's basically Bobby's house, you know, and this guy threw a fucking bottle at her, uh, at the lady Nadia. Uh, this shit turned into a shit show. I went to go turn turn the door and the fucking crew runs right in. And I know what's going on, you know what I'm saying? I'm seeing, you know, revolvers, rubber bands around them. I'm like, somebody's going to get fucking whacked. And they're like, you stay here. And I'm like, what's going on? what happened? And I'm like, I don't know. I turned my back for a minute to pay the bill and I just hear a fucking bottle go flying. This shit got so fucking stupid. You know, one guy tried to sneak out. Who started this whole fucking shit? This dumb Romanian fuck. This guy, Peter, you know, from Howard Beach. Uh, They beat him outside. This guy didn't like the beating that he took. Tried to get me involved in it by saying, oh, you know, you know me better than you know them. Uh, Well, I grew up with these, you know, these fucking, uh, gangsters and these fucking these kids that are you know getting made and you know they're all associates and everything and i'm like you want me to choose them you know over you what the fuck are you gonna do these guys can whack me what the fuck are you gonna do? you know uh this turned into a big stink where he actually got rudai involved fucking alex rudai from the bronx and um you know i don't know what ended up happening was it a was a meeting with bobby or something but then i got questioned by rudai i happened to be in this same cat fucking cafe and they came in and you know, him trying to flex, you know, who I am and this and that. And right. not that I'm starting, trying to sit there and shit on him. But I was like, you know, like, you know, I was young, dumb and full of cum still. And I didn't give a fuck. I was like, I don't give a fuck who you are. Like, you know, and the guy that brought him to me, I was like, yo, how dare you do that? Like, you know, you're now kissing ass trying to be a mobster. You're a fucking factory worker, you know. 
And right. uh, I said, go talk to Bobby. Go, you know, go, it's Bobby's guys. Go talk to Bobby. Why are you talking to me? Because you're one of ours. I'm like, I'm not one of you. I'm Serbian Romanian. I go, I'm far from one of you. Right. I go, now I'm right. one of you? I go, get, get out of here. Like, are you out of your fucking mind? And, well, not uh, only that, he was on your turf. It's not like you were in his Albania. Yeah, and he club, came. He came. You know? He came on purpose for that reason because he came specifically to the bar. That's like a, a, a Balkan mentality type thing. If you go to the scene of the crime and you show you got the fucking, you know, the balls, that, that's like showing like you're gonna do something. And nothing ever became of this. This guy who got the shit knocked out of him by one of Bobby's guys ended up fucking moving to Connecticut like within eight months. So. It goes to show you, you know, this guy was a, a player for 20 years in Ridgewood and doing stuff. You know, he got a, he, he got pistol whipped and fucking, I don't know what happened. He ended up going fucking moving to fucking Connecticut. So, you know, and from that incident, uh, this remaining guy paid somebody in fucking Howard Beach to squash this whole thing, which ended up getting to Bobby. And Bobby didn't like it. Bobby did not like this fucking guy whatsoever. And I remember Bobby calling for me. And Bobby just goes, I heard that you put the CDs in the jukebox in this bar. And I was like, yeah, I did. He goes, well, he goes, I'm going to ask you a fucking favor. I said, Bobby, there's no favor to be asked. You tell me what to do, I do it. He goes, I want those CDs in two hours. He goes, uh, and I know it's Friday night and I know it's busy, but this motherfucker disrespected the, you know, my, my Gumar's fucking sister and this and that. And you know how that goes. I'm like done i stood there for two hours they didn't want to up the cds so you know you could see when i went back to bobby after two hours and i went in the back i was like i need to speak to bobby bobby waving me in and he closed you know closed the door behind me and bobby just looked at me you could see in his fucking face something bad was gonna happen you know and mm -hmm. basically he goes to me go back in 45 minutes i just need you to do a run by and tell me if it's done i go what's done he goes you'll know and <laughs> Dude, it was day. This the whole place was just like plate glass windows. I think I mentioned in the last interview. They threw hammers. They threw fucking bricks. They were hitting patrons in the head. They shut that place down that Friday. Well, Saturday morning, I get a call from the uh, other owner. Come pick up your CDs. <laughs> so that was it. Like you know, it was and and that was a subtle way. That was very subtle. Okay, because um, I think um, one of the guys in the crew wanted to do, take it a little step further. They they were pissed. They wanted, you know, I think they wanted to pop somebody. I went back and Bobby told me, he goes, look, you go there? I go, yeah, I do. He goes, well, I want you to frequent a little more often and look in there and see if your CDs end up getting miraculously put back in there. I mean, like, did they, did they do my CDs, you know, because I was a DJ, I made CDs for people. So I was like, okay, I did. And I was like, nah, the CDs are new, it's just whatever. The guy was a douchebag anyway, fucking this guy, Peter. Um, he's, he's now in fucking um, Fort Lauderdale. He ended up buying a big house. You know, the kind of schmuck he is, I'll give you a little quick history on him. He ended up, he was a doctor. Uh, I really don't give a fuck that it's going out there. He pulled the wrong kidney out on the, on the fucking patient. So he lost his fucking license as, you know, to, 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 to be a doctor and to do surgery and all of that. And he ended up having, you know, uh, two kids with, the, with a waitress from the bar or whatever. They got married and they live in fucking Fort Lauderdale. That was the guy that got pistol whipped by Bobby's crew. No, that was the guy who got beat up by Bobby's crew. Right, okay. But the okay. guy that got pistol with talked talk bad to one of Bobby's main guys. Okay, okay, that guy gotcha. Got pistol with. Gotcha. I mean, you right. know, he I think he, he would have I think he would have been off right there on the street, but that in itself is like a couple little stories with Bobby that I that I dealt with. I mean, I would you know, like I said, he, he spoke to me prior to getting arrested because he saw that I was just you know, not around as much, but what are you up to, kid? You know, what are you doing? What's going on? You know, and I'm like, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. The one time I remember I brought my kid in, you know, in the bassinet, and I put him down. You know, I had a tracksuit on. My kid had a tracksuit on. And he laughed. He thought it was cute, but he said, is this what you want your little man to do? And, you know, like, I didn't think about it him until a couple of the other guys came over. Hey, look at little Paijan, you know, and they put a little 20 bucks on him. You know, he's giggling, a little, you know. And I'm like, is, is is this what I want my kid to do? Basically, he was just like, yeah, why don't you move out to Long Island or maybe out to like North Jersey or something like that. And I started looking, you know, and I got lucky. I found the house. My kid grew up not knowing a fucking thing. All he knew that everybody was uncle this, uncle that. He didn't know if we were really family with anybody until, you know, Grand Theft Auto came into play. And funny, the main character's name is Nico Belich, and he's, uh, he's Serbian from Bosnia like you. And I'm like, uh-huh. He was... 
and he kind of like does stuff that you do. Like he goes around and collects and does this and does <laughs> that, and you know, like stupid shit like that. And I'm like, uh, you gotta stop playing Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> I go, you know, and um, you know, I went to, you know, I got diagnosed with cancer after that. As right. I said, um, you know, and um, that that first one was it was okay. They removed it, but then it just came back again. So. You know, at that time, you start, to, everything goes through your fucking head. Like, you know, you're like, what, what did I do? What did I, who, who did I wrong? You know, and, um, you know, my wife was having an affair. I found out about that. I, that fucking threw me over the fucking edge. Uh, I basically just like, you know, let the bank take the fucking house, uh, move back to fucking Queens, you know. And then I ran into Vito. Vito, another epiphany right there, just basically told me, he's like, you need to get the fuck out of here, you know. I really think that had I stayed in, in Ridgewood, not having Bobby, you know, Frankie was gone. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, uh, you know, the new the new people that were up and coming. I mean, I still I still have reach with people. Like, I could, you know, I did a bad thing. I set up a meeting for, for a friend of a friend, and that guy ended up fucking me on that. And I shouldn't have did that. And the guy came to me. And he goes, you're good. You're good with us. He goes, you didn't know that this guy was going to scumbag you. And, you know, try to milk his way past, you know, and this and that. And he used you as a get, you know, get through the, get through the door pass, you know. And I'm like, I really apologize. I never would do this. You know, like, I, I wouldn't, like, vouch for somebody if I didn't know. You know, the word is the guy's a rat. I don't know if it's true. You know, I, I've spoken about him before. I don't want to mention his name and give him any props. But, uh, you know, it's kind of funny how you're sitting there in MDC fucking four years, everybody else has already fucking been sent to Allenwood or fucking Allentown or Allenwood or wherever. You know, this guy's not. This guy's still sitting there, you know? Mm -hmm. Frankie's, even, Frankie's even said it, like, you know, uh, you know, I'm going in. And he goes, I'm, I'm getting transferred. He goes, and, and this guy's, he's, he's, he's going out. Like, as, he goes, it's just a little too funny for me, you know? Mm -hmm. I said, well, do you see any 302s or anything? He goes, he goes, Pedge at that time, he goes, everybody's name was on everything. He goes, you know, you'd be surprised who's ratting on who, you know. So, but with Bobby, I'm going to be honest with you. Like I've always said, he's been a perfect gentleman. Everybody in the neighborhood knew, you know, if you needed money, you go to Bobby. You know, that that was, that's what he was known for. You know, right. the other things came into play because you just saw people coming and going with envelopes. And once I got introduced and I got vouched for that, you know, I can go in the back and play cards. Then you've seen more of that. You know what I'm saying? It, right. was, it was more, you know, and Bobby would get out, go around the corner, because the feds were watching that corner. You know, between Fresh Pond Road, uh, Nickabaca, you know, the area, some areas in Lower Ridgewood, you, you know, nobody was a jerk. You could see the cameras blinking. You know, they were like across the street in the second floor, you know, apartment through the shutters, and part of the shutter was missing. You know, it was, they would have to walk, covered in mouth, you know, like, like just like in Goodfellas and all those other fucking movies. That's the way it was. It was... They right. were being watched from roofs, from there, from, you know, that's why I'm really surprised Bobby lasted as long as he did. He was very quiet, you know. I mean, he had his gumar. I knew, I knew Dora. Dora. Dora got deported. She ended up, after Bobby passed, she ended up doing a credit card scam with some Romanian crew. Both her and her sister got deported, as with 13 other Romanians. Um, so I keep, in, I keep in contact with uh, Dora's sister, Nadia, still. But, um... Like I said, Bobby, you know, was a gentleman, but, you know, knowing his history and knowing that he whacked two guys that we know of, I'm pretty right. sure there's more than that, you know. Yeah, but, or uh, or even know, if he didn't himself, he, you know, he, he could have given yeah, the he order. Ordered it. Right. I mean, listen to me, he, he, uh, that whole fucking incident, I kind of got scared when he told me to get the CDs out. I really got scared because, you know, the crew that was running around, they were like a Giannini type crew. They were ready to do anything for Bobby. You know what I mean? They were they were ready to do anything. You know, right? Um, so w when I heard that, you know, his crew got pinched, I was just, you know, like who who could have ratted? And some guy Santos or some shit that was running around with Bobby at the time. He he kind of like gave him the the, the the two murders, but they were already building a case. I mean, if they had racketeering and gambling and extortion and fucking you name it under oh, the sun. Oh, they, they hit him with a know. lot of stuff. Once you have those RICO, federal RICO charges and stuff, it's it's really hard to get out from underneath that. I mean, the writing it, pretty it much is, is on the wall. He, he had a piece, he had a piece of everything. I'm not going to sit there and say he didn't. Um, you know, I, like I said, I tried to be respectful. I, you know, I, I left a lot of people, a lot of names out. I don't want to involve anybody. I don't want to implicate anybody. 
I sure as hell don't want anybody knocking on my fucking door. I mean, we drank the Kool-Aid, like Frankie Fertolino says. You know, uh, you know, I was there. I saw a lot of shit. You know, I got, I got, I got lucky. I love, listen, I love talking about the old days. It gives me a time to like, you know, rehash and, you know, like give some insight if I can. I mean, coming to America, most of these people ended up in Bushwick and then from Bushwick, it went to Ridgewood, to Glendale. You know, it, it wasn't only just, you know, the Bronx, fucking, you know, Brooklyn, you know, it was Bushwick, Ridgewood, Glendale. It was a hotbed back in the 70s and 80s. The 80s and 90s were crazy, you know. Um, I got I got blessed, you know, rubbing shoulders with a lot of these fucking a lot of these people. You know, I got I got blessed. A couple of the guys that I rubbed shoulders with were stone cold killers, but uh, you know, Bobby. I mean, he he made me feel comfortable. I can't sit there and say nothing. You know, Frank said he was a really nice guy. You know, he'd pick him up from the bar when he was drunk, and I mean, Frank. Yeah, no, Frank he was, basically said he was a really nice guy too. You know, listen, I took him home. I took him home one time. You know, he was in a in the remaining show, social club, and it was late, and he was mm -hmm. like. You know, he was, he had a few and he was just like, you know, oh, I'll take a cab. And I'm like, no, 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 Bobby, I'm taking you. I'm taking you wherever you got to go. He's like, I don't want to put you out of your way. You're having a good time. I'm like, no, it, it was like a grandfather, like, an uncle, right, you know, like you, there was no, you know, it, no one in the back of your head, you know, he did two murders and he was, you know, an acting, acting boss. It, it, it didn't dawn on you because he didn't, he didn't have that like. John Gotti mystique, not, not even mystique, whatever it was, that, the bravado. You right. know, with John Gotti, it was like, you saw it on his face, fuck you. And he carried himself like a rock star, you know? I mean, he had that yeah, that yeah. aura about him. Right, right. Right, so, you know, for, you know, for me, you know, like I said, you know, uh, that cafe, to this day, like, if I go back to New York, it's not a cafe anymore, it, it was a bar, and that didn't turn out too well, then it turned into a Romanian cafe. Now I heard either Albanians or Somebody took it over, but it's still the mystique. Like, I still call it Bobby's place, you know what I mean? Like, that place was there for, what, 25, 30 years, you know? It, wow. it, it was, you know, it was a staple in that neighborhood. And right across the street was a German restaurant that's still there to this day, you know? Wow, so, very cool. I hope that the few people that did write you and email you, I hope they found this interesting. And I'm not trying to be that tough guy no more. I'm just like, I'm just trying to make ends meet, you know what I'm saying? I got right. my house, my house is paid. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm living that Florida life as you are. Other than that, I hope I hope somebody enjoys this. I, I hope, uh, you know, they get a kick out of the stories and stuff. And, you know, well, uh, and we will, you know, and for the it. people who are interested in, in, you know, the our first interview that we did that was more on the Serbian history, uh, Pedge and I are going to probably follow that up. We're going to do some more stuff on that as well, because I'm yeah. that, I'm I'm interested in that. And, uh, well, I'd like to, lot, I'd like know, to so. put it out there and do my insight when, uh, I met Bosco and, um, I kind of got introduced to that whole, the Pink Panther Jewel Thief gang. And, you know, for that brief couple of months, like I met some heavy hitters and at well, why don't we seventies and eighties? Why don't we talk know, about the, that and try? And maybe we'll just set up yeah, like a small follow up and, and cover that. Yeah, you know? let's 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 do that because that was a big a big thing, you know, during the the late seventies and early eighties, and that's how Bosco made him made himself, you know, head of the Westies. You know how he got called in and right. he was just voted right in, and you know they were big players at that time. So right, I'd like 100%. to do a segment on that if possible. Yeah. We'll, let, we'll we'll talk we'll talk off the phone and um yeah, we'll, you know definitely. try to put put something together and we'll just follow that up maybe after the holidays. You got it, you got uh, it Mike. All right, my brother. I'll talk Always to you. Always a pleasure. All right, you buddy. Bye -bye. Talk to you. Bye.